Hello everyone. Welcome to the section on P, NP and NP completeness as part of the algorithms course created by Stanford Crowd Growth Initiative. Alright, today we are going to be talking about P, NP and NP completeness which are essentially complexity classes. So get excited because there's a lot of information coming your way. Alright, we'll start with what is P? We've developed several algorithms so far for problems such as finding shortest paths in a graph, searching for an element in an array, and sorting arrays. We call these algorithms efficient because they grow in order of polynomial time with respect to the size of the inputs. So we've seen that these algorithms are often big O of n, big O of n squared, big O of n cubed, etc. Such problems fall in the polynomial complexity class, or we say that these problems are in P. Now what is NP? NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial. It's used to represent a class of problems that satisfy the following condition. Supposing we could generate a guess about the solution. The solution should be verifiable as valid or invalid in polynomial time. This verification step is called a certificate. Now P is clearly a subset of NP. Because if a problem can be solved itself in polynomial time, we can just generate the solution and ignore the certificate. Now we'll talk about what NP complete is. We believe that some problems are intrinsically unsolvable by polynomial time algorithms. Although the solutions can be verified in polynomial time, there's no known efficient way to find these solutions in the first place. Formally, a problem X is said to be NP complete if X is in NP and every problem in NP is reducible to X in polynomial time. From a practical point of view, discovering a problem is NP complete indicates that you will have difficulty finding an efficient algorithm for it. If you could, you would also have solved every known NP complete problem as all these problems are polynomially reducible to each other. Let's examine one of these problems. It's called the 3 sat problem. Okay, we'll start off with the sat problem. What is a sad problem? That supposing you are given a Boolean formula in conjunctive normal form, you must either provide a satisfying truth assignment or say that none exists. What is conjunctive normal form? It's nothing but a conjunction of disjunctive clauses. So disjunction is nothing but the OR operator. So what you are essentially saying is that you have a Boolean formula that is made up of clauses. These clauses are ANDED or are in conjunction. Within these clauses, all the literals are OR or are in disjunction. Now suppose that each of these clauses was only allowed to have three literals, at most three literals. We call this the three sat problem. The three sat problem is nothing but a special case of the sat problem. Okay, so we have the three sat problem. So one way of solving the three sat problem is you can try every possible combination of truth assignments for the n variables. So it's clear to see that there are two power n such possibilities. So if we take this approach, we would be running in big O of 2 power n. But if somebody gave us the solution, then it's very easy to see that if um, it satisfies the Boolean formula. So these are the two conditions for NP, right? That even if um, the problem itself is not solvable, if someone generated a solution, you should have a certificate that um, runs in polynomial time that says whether the solution is valid or not. So thus the 3 sat problem is in NP. In fact, it is NP complete. It was one of the first known NP complete problems and it was independently solved by Cook and Levin in 1971 and 1973. And this problem is often used as a starting point to show that other problems are NP complete. So this brings us to an interesting junction. To show that a problem is NP complete, we need to show two things. One, that it is in NP. And second, that we need to show that a known NP complete problem is polynomially reducible to it. So this implies that if we found a solution to a new problem in polynomial time, we will be able to find a solution to all NP complete problems in polynomial time as they are all polynomially uh, reducible to each other. Thus, this new problem is at least as hard as the hardest problems in NP. So all these proofs are a combination of identifying the right problem to reduce and the constructions to make to reduce them. Why do we choose only one problem to reduce? Because if we are able to prove that um, one problem is reducible to our problem, 
then every other problem in the class of MP complete is reducible to that problem in polynomial time. So um, by extension, we have shown that our problem is at least as hard as any of the NP complete problems. All right, now we'll look at a few interesting problems so to um, elucidate this idea further. So um, the first such problem we look at is the independent set problem, which asks that given a graph G, can you find a subset of K vertices such that there is no edge between any of the vertices in K? The maximal independent set problem is the question of finding the largest such subset. So there exists a certificate for the independent set problem certainly. As if someone gave you the k vertices in a graph G, you can easily iterate over the vertices and check that none of them have an edge to any other vertex in that subset. So this shows that the independent set problem is in NP. Now we need to show that the independent set problem is NP complete. To do this, our first step is to pick a problem to reduce to the independent set problem. We have just seen the three set problem, so we will choose that problem to reduce the independent set. So supposing you have um, a clause in the three set problem, say it's x or y or z. You can represent this clause by a triangle with each vertex labeled x, y, z. Now construct a graph G with, where each of these clauses are represented by a triangle. Draw an edge between each literal and its complement. Why do we choose triangles? Because a triangle has its three vertices maximally connected and thus forces us to pick only one of them for the independent set because if you pick two of the vertices of the triangle, there would be an edge between two vertices of the independent set, which is not allowed. So once you repeat this construction for all clauses, a clause with uh, two literals will simply be represented by an edge joining the literals. And since we have connected the complemented literals with the edge, if we set k equal to the number of clauses, a solution of the independent set problem in this graph will also satisfy the Boolean formula. Now this is plain to see because um, each clause we need to pick at least one vertex because now we have got uh, we have said that we want a k sized independent set. So um, and we need uh, and a k sized independent set will lead to a consistent solution because since we have said that there is an edge between every literal and its complement. We cannot possibly pick a literal and its complement to be a part of the independent set. Why? Because if you picked a literal and its complement to be a part of the independent set, there would be an edge in our independent set which is not allowed. To, so to form a satisfying truth assignment, we just pick one literal from each clause and give it the value true. And we have consistent choices. So in this way we have shown that um, the three set problem reduces to the independent set problem and that the independent set problem is NP complete. Now we look at the clique problem which asks that given a graph G, can you find a subset of K vertices such that there is an edge between all of the vertices in the subset? So there easily exists a certificate for the clique problem. If someone gave you a K size subset, you can iterate over the vertices and check that each vertex is connected to every other vertex in the subset. So now we know that the clique problem is in NP. Now we have to show that the clique problem is NP complete. So the first step is choosing a problem to reduce to the clique problem. The NP complete problem we'll choose will be the independent set problem. So we've just seen that the independent set problem is NP complete. So if you are given an instance G of the independent set problem, you can reduce it to the clique problem by taking the complement of the graph G and finding a clique in it. So the key idea over here is you want to make sure that yes instances in your new graph G dash map to yes instances in your graph G and no instances in G dash map to no instances in G. So a yes instance in G dash, what, what does this mean, a yes instance in G dash? It means that a click in G dash maps to the presence of an independent set in G and the absence of a click in G dash makes sure that there is no independent set of size K in G. So it's obvious that if you have a clique of size k in G dash, you will have a uh, an independent set of size k in G. Why? Because um, if you have a clique of size k in G dash, then each vertex is connected uh, to every other vertex by uh, edges. So if you take the complement of this graph, which brings you back to the original graph G, none of these vertices are connected to any other vertex by edges. So they will form an independent set of size k in G. Similarly, supposing when you started in G, if you had an independent set of size k, 
there would be edges between each vertex and all other vertices in G dash and these vertices would have formed a k-size clique in G dash. So this proves that a no instance in G dash will map to a no instance in G. Alright, now we look at another problem, the vertex cover problem, which asks that given a graph G, can you find a subset of k vertices such that every edge in the graph has at least one of its n vertices in this subset? One way of going about this is, you can iterate over all n choose, uh, choose k subsets of vertices in G and check whether they form a vertex cover. Finding um, whether these vertices form a vertex cover can be done in polynomial time. You simply iterate over every edge in the graph and check whether one of its endpoints is within the subsets you have chosen. So this is a certificate and it's clear that the vertex cover problem is in NP. But to show that the vertex cover problem is NP-complete, we need to reduce a known NP-complete problem to the vertex cover problem. For this, we will choose the independent set. Now, this reduction is similar, uh, simple to see. Finding a k-sized independent set in a graph is equivalent to finding a v-k-sized vertex cover in a graph. Why is this the case? To do this, we will show that the yes instances map to yes instances. So if you could find a v-k-sized vertex cover, then it's clear that v minus v minus k, which evaluates to k, will have to be an independent set. Why not? Why? Because otherwise you have an edge between these vertices, which is not covered by the vertex cover. This is not allowed. Similarly, if you had a k-sized independent set in a graph, then there definitely exists a vertex cover of size v minus k. Why? Because all the edges have to be amongst the remaining vertices, not amongst this k-sized set. So, and thus we have shown that the vertex cover problem is NP-complete by reducing independent set to vertex cover. Now we will look at the dominating set problem. The dominating set problem asks that if you are given a graph G, can you find a subset of K vertices such that every vertex in the graph is adjacent to at least one of the vertices in this subset? Now these are different from the vertex cover problem because here we are interested in dominating vertices, not covering edges. So a graph like the one shown, it's easy to see that if you just pick one of the vertices, every other vertex is adjacent to that vertex, thus it dominates every other vertex. So you can get easily get a dominating set of size 1. But if you want to cover edges, you need to pick at least two vertices, so you will have a vertex cover of size 2. The dominating set problem is NP-complete. To show this, we will reduce vertex cover to dominating set. <coughs> Supposing you have a vertex cover instance G. Now you replace every edge in G by a triangle using gadget vertices. Gadget vertices are just artificial vertices we um, insert. So we make every edge in G a triangle. Now a yes instance of dominating set in G dash, which is a new graph constructed after replacing every edge in G with a triangle, will give a yes instance of vertex cover. Why is this true? Because we won't pick any of the gadget vertices in our dominating set solution. <coughs> Why? Because um, the gadget vertices can only dominate the two vertices at the ed, uh, at its endpoints. So we might as well pick one of those two vertices to be in our dominating set solution. And um, we must pick at least one of these vertices that forms an edge because they are the only vertices that can dominate the gadget vertices. In this way, we end up covering all the edges. So this is essentially a reduction from the vertex cover problem to the dominating set problem. All right, so now we've seen a set of NP-complete problems. A quick recap, we started off with 3SAT. We reduced 3SAT to independent set to show independent set is NP-complete. We reduced independent set to clique to show that in clique is NP-complete. For vertex cover, we reduced independent set to vertex cover and show that vertex cover is NP-complete. Then we reduced vertex cover to dominating set and show that dominating set is NP-complete. Now we will talk about a very interesting question, which is, is P equal to NP? So we have seen that there are two um, complexity classes, P and NP. And, um, what we are essentially wondering is whether um, we have polynomial time algorithms for all the problems that we know are in NP and we just haven't found them yet. We know certainly that P is a subset of NP, but the question we are asking here is, is it a perfect subset? So this is actually one of the deepest and most important unsolved problems in computer science. There's a prize of $1 million by the Clay Mathematical Institute for the first correct solution to this problem. 
if we can get a proof either way about p equal to np it has a profound implication in a variety of fields because saying p equal to np is kind of like saying that coming up with a solution to a problem is just as easy as verifying a solution once it is given so you could think in layman's terms what does this mean for creativity this being able to evaluate a work of art as either good or bad equivalent to being able to produce the work of art itself all right thanks a lot for your time i hope you found this section interesting and would like to read further about p equal to np and other interesting problems in complexity theory thank you